the Colossus class were the last 12-inch armed dreadnoughts of the Royal Navy, and also marked the end of the relatively brief second-generation dreadnoughts in the same service. By 1908, only four years after the first decisions had been made on the design of Dreadnought herself, the new British battleline consisted of that ship and two largely derivative classes, the Bellerophon and St Vincent classes, plus the sole second generation vessel, HMS Neptune. It was planned to build two vessels in the 1909 battleship programme, and these would be derivatives of the Neptune and thus share many similar features. However, the public and media, getting wind of Germany ramping up naval production, would start the We Want 8 and We Won't Wait campaign, which would end up seeing the first generation super dreadnoughts, the Orion class, and their battlecruiser counterparts, Lion and Princess Royal, laid down in the same year. As Churchill famously recorded, the Admiralty wanted six, the Treasury wanted four, and we ended up compromising on eight. Anyway, they were armed with 10 of the Mark 11 12 inch 50 caliber guns in five twin turrets, one forward, two super firing aft, and two en echelon amidships with some limited cross deck firing. A secondary battery of 16 single 4 inch guns was mostly concentrated in the forward superstructure, with a few in the small aft superstructure. Three torpedo tubes completed the offensive armament, one on each side and one aft, armed with 21-inch torpedoes, which was a step up from the older 18-inch model on Neptune. Four saluting guns were also included, and the armour had an 11-inch maximum thickness along with a 4-inch deck, and the ships could make 21 knots using four shafts, which delivered 25,000 shaft horsepower. They were not, however, the best of the second generation dreadnought designs across the planet, far from it. Unlike their companions on the docks that year, the original plan for these ships had been to improve on the Neptune in places, but without increasing cost, which put a lot of constraints on the design that weren't helped by some other rather questionable decisions. Now, there were some good changes. Some of the thinner armour plates on the extremes were removed, and the saved weight was relocated to better torpedo defence, although this particular system's overall length and coverage was reduced, as well as thicker deck armour plates, as compared to the Neptune design. And they also continued Neptune's trend of introducing the super-firing turret to the fleet. The aft mast was also removed, as the fire control station there in Neptune was almost perpetually enveloped in smoke. However, due to the loss of the aft mast as a position to fix heavy boat cranes to, the foremast was moved back slightly to give these cranes a new mounting point, which in turn moved that mast behind the forward funnel, which now meant the forward fire control station was now an excellent place to make kippers, and that was about it. And this was made even worse by bringing the two wing turrets closer together linearly, which moved the machinery spaces around, and thus meant that two-thirds of the boilers now all vented through that same forward funnel. The relocation of the wing turrets also reduced their arcs of fire, and cross-deck blast effects were bad enough that a full 10-gun broadside was marked as only for use in actual battle conditions as this was pretty much the only situation where the Admiralty was prepared to accept the repairs that would be necessary to the flying superstructure that would be the inevitable result of the cross-deck firing. And that brings us to the flying superstructure itself. This was designed as a place to put the ship's boats in order to keep the decks clear for the en echelon turrets, which was fine in theory, but there was a good chance in practice that in the event of a shell hit to this area, they could collapse and at best block cross-deck firing, at worst fall onto and jam the wing turrets themselves. Nonetheless, two ships were ordered, Colossus and Hercules, both laid down in July 1909, launched in 1910 and commissioned in the summer of 1911, entering service with the home fleet. Their World War I service, like much of the now renamed Grand Fleet, was relatively uneventful except for Jutland, where Colossus became the only battleship of the Grand Fleet to be hit by shellfire, taking two hits from Seidlitz during the second major fleet encounter, but to relatively little effect on its fighting ability. Colossus in turn scored a number of hits on Seidlitz and Der Flinger. 
During the war, the secondary batteries would be reduced in favour of adding 4-inch and 3-inch anti-aircraft guns, with the two ships visually distinguishable by Colossus's secondary battery firing through ports that had droppable covers, whilst Hercules' 4-inch guns had gun shields. The aft part of the flying boat deck was also removed mid-war. After the war, both ships would be sent to the reserve fleet, with Hercules sold in 1921 and scrapped in 1922, whilst Colossus was refitted and partially disarmed to serve as a training vessel, and in this guise would become the only dreadnought to be painted in the old Victorian black, white and buff peacetime colour scheme. That role would only last a year, and she would spend most of the rest of the 1920s as a hulk attached to the training school HMS Impregnable, until she was also sold for scrap in 1928. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.